So my name is Madison Schramm. I'm a postdoctoral fellow at Carnegie Mellon University at the Institute for Politics and Strategy. Um, I completed my PhD at Georgetown University in 2019 in government, focusing on international relations. And my research looks broadly at leaders and decision making. Um, so in particular, my dissertation examined why democracies might be predisposed to target certain types of autocratic regimes, emphasizing uh, decision making within democracies, particularly the US and Western Europe. Um, I also look at how gender or perceptions thereof inform different types of decision making. So we're in um, an exciting time where we have uh, more women heads of government than we have previously, and these numbers seem to be accelerating. Um, but there hasn't been a lot of studies examining how on a national level um, gender perceptions thereof affect the ability of the head of government to make a variety of different decisions, particularly regarding security. Um, so this is something that I've um, been examining for the past few years. This, this may be um, more by way of background than is, than is of interest, but when I was studying um, political theory as an undergraduate, I was reading Kant and thinking about perpetual peace and simultaneously, I was taking classes in sociology and international relations, and I was encountering different arguments related to the democratic piece, which is the empirical finding that de democracies are less likely to engage in conflict with one another. And one of the things I found fascinating about this was that despite this sort of empirical rule, um, which has been described by Levy and others, that the actual mechanisms that have been described didn't seem to make much sense with what I was studying. Um, so this got me curious, particularly growing up at a time when the US had recently gone to war in Iraq, and um, I was thinking about US foreign policy decision making broadly and what makes democracies particularly different. And I encountered some interesting readings by folks like Ito Oren and Mike Desch and Sebastian Rosado that really challenged some of the foundational um, assumptions made within the democratic piece. And this got me wondering, so we have this empirical finding that democracies are less likely to engage with, in war with one another, but we also know they're just as conflict prone as autocratic regimes. So when do democracies engage in conflict with autocracies and which type? And are these kind of institutional features of democracies still able to explain their patterns of conflict with autocratic regimes? And part of this was born out of thinking about who our adversaries had been, who in these autocratic regimes, at least within the US, we had considered to be particularly threatening. And it struck me that they were highly salient individuals or folks that provided potentially a symbol that was more evocative than uh, abstract discussions of sort of geostrategic geo interests or material capabilities. So I started to look at what type of states democracies tended to engage with. And I found that democracies were about two to three times more likely to target personalist regimes or states that have leaders with sort of unconstrained power, particularly uh, they don't have veto players in uh, an assembly or an economic elite or civil society that can kind of curb their decision making. And I found this interesting, but sort of consistent with my intuition, right? So an example of a personalist regime or a uh, sort of illustrative example, a perfect example of a personalist regime would be Saddam Hussein, um, thinking about the Gulf War, but also 2003. And that's not to say that there weren't very powerful folks that um, had a say in what was going on, but rather there wasn't any institutional mechanisms um, that were able to um, override his authority, especially on matters of foreign policy. Another interesting example of this, and I think probably what got me thinking about uh, my dissertation research, was thinking about Iran in 2015. So former president Ahmadinejad left office and a new president came to power, Rouhani. But Iran's a very strange case where you actually have the supreme leader of the country making the vast majority of decisions with regard to foreign policy and has the majority of power on domestic policy or policy within the state as well. And yet there seemed to be some shift in how the US and other states viewed Iran 
after Ahmadinejad, the president, left office and Rouhani came to power. And this seems strange because the institutions hadn't changed. The same supreme leader was still in charge. And yet you had a perceptual shift in the U.S. and elsewhere regarding the threat that Iran posed. And actually looking at congressional records, I found that during the period of Ahmadinejad's presidency, Congress mentioned him about three to four times more often than they talked about the supreme leader. And so this got me wondering, how do these sort of images of these leaders, of these personalists like Saddam Hussein, affect our decision making? How does having a vivid, tangible adversary make us perceive threat, make us more likely to come to an agreement? And what does it mean when those decision makers are no longer in power? So what does it mean that Ahmadinejad left office? Did that mean that there's potentially space for us to come to more of an agreement? So this was some of my um, initial work that got me into the broader dis dissertation project, looking at democracies and threat perception, but in particular, how leaders in democracy think about threat. So I was interested in, in how these symbols might evoke, uh, evoke threat. And looking at the different types of expl explanations, particularly the sort of institutional or rationalist explanation, the lack of institutional restraints, um, which inherently makes a country more threatening. And we see this argument going back to ancient Greece, right? Lack of institutional constraints are, are very threatening. And I didn't find that answer particularly satisfying. And actually, when I looked at the statistical analysis and case studies, one of the things that struck me is that if these institutional constraints were sufficient to make these states, these personalist regimes, more threatening, then we would expect all types of governments, all types of states, to be just as likely to target them because they're inherently more threatening. But they weren't. It's just democracies and personalist regimes. So this implies that there might be something specific to democracies that make these types of states particularly threatening. So I focus on two aspects of this. So the first are cognitive biases or common heuristics, like the vividness effect and attribution. Um, first, which makes us more likely to perceive tangible or vivid information to weigh that more heavily than discussions kind of of abstract. Um, and this, this brings in research from folks uh, like Karen Yarmilo um, and then uh, Paul Slovak and others. And so if this were the case though, this is also not sufficient because you have, again, if this were the case, if this was a cognitive bias that everyone experienced, we would expect all states to target personalist regimes more. But it's just democracies. And so I argued that these cognitive biases are reinforced or augmented by particular social narratives that are powerful within the US and Western Europe, some of which are, were really hardened in the aftermath of World War II, but that have come to define autocracy and personalist leaders and dictators in particular as sort of anathema to the self. And that reinforces these biases like vividness and attribution, predisposing democratic leaders to identify these types of autocracies with these very salient figures, these very salient leaders, as more threatening. Um, and so my argument actually doesn't focus on democracy per se or autocracy per se, but perceptions of these types of state and how that relates to their institutional configuration, um, but how the, the, the social narratives of the leaders and democracies kind of compound these different psychological mechanisms to produce particular outcomes with regard to conflict. So this is a great question. So when leaders describe in personal uh, documents, internal documents, and they use analogies to Mussolini and Hitler to refer to Saddam Hussein, is that because they genuinely perceive that leader to be more threatening and they identify certain parallels? Or is it because they're trying to drum up public support? And based on my research, I, I find both through survey experiments, but also through um, looking at different archival uh, material from the Eisenhower Library, the Bush Presidential Library, um, Prime Minister Eden in the UK, uh, that these seem to be genuinely held beliefs. That being said, that doesn't mean they're not also gathering public support. So I think these, these two things can sit together. And so 
sometimes we think of these as competing or alternative explanations, but they can both be functioning. Um, and so I do think there is likely an instrumental rationale or benefit um, given the timing of when this language was being used, how early it started before public statements. Um, there also seems to be a substantial component of it that is genuinely held uh, beliefs or motivating the behavior of these leaders in democracies. So I started working with Alexander Stark after we both um, were, we were starting to miss some of our, our previous training and study of feminist theory. And one way in particular we were interested is being trained in international security. And I focused on leaders and she, uh, Alex focused on intervention, particularly in the Middle East. We were both wondering how dynamics regarding gender or the patriarchy or um, even sex as sort of biological differences might be informing these different things we were studying. And that wasn't something, unfortunately, um, we were reading a lot about in our classes. And there's a rich scholarship exploring these different facets. There's feminist, there's feminist perspectives or sort of a, a feminist ontology or how to approach the study of international relations. There's incorporating gender as a uh, social construct as a variable at different levels of analysis. And then there's, there's sort of the incorporation of of sex or biological explanations for different outcomes. So there's different ways to potentially incorporate gender, feminist theory, and sex into the study of international relations. And really it's already there, right? It actually is an, I, I believe, a, an ordering principle um, that we don't tend to pay as much attention to in the, the mainstream international relations literature. But nonetheless, there's a tremendous amount of excellent research on this topic. Unfortunately, it tends to be siloed um, in specialty journals. But we in particular were interested in how perceptions of gender affected decision making. And one of the things we found interesting uh, from work from Horowitz, uh, Ryder and Stam, as well as um, Valerie Hudson, folks that had looked at um, gender and incorporated it into um, quantitative analysis was how this might affect intervention security decision making. And sort of based on our experience and also watching the elections at the time, one of the things that struck us was often the sort of normative assumption or this common folk wisdom that women are sort of naturally inclined to be more peaceful than their male counterparts. And based on our knowledge, just superficially at the time, of a few of the cases, this didn't really seem to, to click. This didn't seem exactly right. Not just assumptions that, you know, essentialize women as behaving in a particular way because of their biology, but also because actually, if we think about Ellen Sirleaf Johnson, if we think about Hillary Clinton, if we think about Margaret Thatcher, right, these aren't folks that we think of even in, historically as peacemakers. So we started to look at what we thought based on these cases, some of the explanations might be for why actually in opposition to sort of conventional wisdom, these women might behave more hawkishly than their male counterparts. And we found that this to be borne out and to really sit well with explanations from feminist theory and include particularly Judith Butler um, and also other social theories regarding uh, thinking of Goffman, how, how individuals behave to signal or to illustrate they're tough, they're one of the guys. And we found this borne out in the statistical analysis, but very importantly, not in all states and not all the time. And this is why it's not an argument about women um, because of their biology or sort of an essential argument about, um, an essentialist argument about women. Because this finding goes away when you increase the representation of women in office more broadly, which indicates that these leaders are signaling their hawkishness as a member of the outgroup. But as soon as that, the salience of that outgroup is ameliorated or is modified by an increased number of women, 
you see the differences between men and women in terms of their behavior with regard to security decision making and the initiation of disputes wash away. And so this is part of a larger project Alex and I and a couple of other folks are working on looking at gender and uh, leaders. So we are also right now looking at why it seems to be that women are most frequently elected under conditions of domestic instability. Um, and a number of folks have noted this, particularly in the comparative literature. And so we look at it cross-nationally, including different measures of instability. And there's some great literature from the business and management side that indicates that there's this, it's not just a glass ceiling, but a glass cliff. And women are more likely to be appointed to uh, the CEO in companies that are failing. And we think there might be a similar phenomena that women are likely to be supported or um, supported or more, more popular under conditions of instability. And we argue that has a lot to do with the assumptions regarding characteristics of leadership. So we frequently, we want our leaders to be agentic, right? But we assume women to be more communitarian. And these two things are at odds, making it more difficult for women under normal circumstances, potentially, to access the highest office. But during a conflict or right after some sort of domestic instability, be it a natural disaster, civil war, interstate conflict, there's more space for a communitarian leader and that becomes more attractive. And so we argue that this is why you tend to see women being popularly supported following domestic instability of these different sorts. And we're also looking at replicating different um, different studies, including um, gender and elite cues. So how does the public weigh information based on the subject matter and the political affiliation of a leader based on their gender? So how does their gender moderate these different characteristics and how much they weigh the information they're getting? So if a woman is telling you, um, if Susan Rice is telling you about human rights, how does that differ from her talking about nuclear security. How might those topics weigh, be weighed differently? Especially when we compare it to, for example, someone like Barack Obama talking about nuclear weapons versus human rights. Are certain issues gendered and that interpret and that informs our uh, assessment of how we weigh the information? Um, so these are just a couple of different projects, but one of the things we found is there are a number of other folks engaging in really rich research um, on these questions as well, but there's a lot to be explored. And part of this, I think, has to do with the fact that gender as an ordering principle, as a variable, as a frame for analysis, hasn't been incorporated to the extent that it should be into mainstream IR. So there's a lot to, to interrogate there. So when I say communitarian traits, we want someone who gets along, who solves problems, who really works together, right? Someone who is, doesn't rock the boat, someone who's supportive. This differs from how we might envision um, a really agentic leader, a strong individual at the helm who we want to take charge, who we want to lead us. And that's different than someone who we want to support us and work with us. And these are different assumptions and inherently gendered. And this is in the feminist uh, ethics of care, but it's also made its way into different, um, different conversations about um, leadership and gender more broadly. But in the sort of literature um, like uh, Ava Feder Kate on, on um, nurturing and feminist responsibility, we see this embedded there. So there's been a lot of research and sort of canonically the resume test, right, where folks given the same resume um, with different folks that just had a different name. And by altering the gender of the name, they found that the characteristics assumed of the applicant but also their, their abilities uh, were assumed to be different if the name of, of the applicant was gendered as male or female. And so going from this, there's been a lot of different research that illustrates that women face particular challenges um, and how they're evaluated in their competency by how they look, 
And we would expect that this also to affect how, how susceptible folks are to the information or messages that they might share. So if this is the case, then what does it mean for a leader or a foreign policy decision maker or an elite to give critical information on different security issues? How would this affect the response of the public or the consumers of that information based on that leader's gender? And there are a variety of different explanations that, um, that might account for the difference, but I think in particular, since we know that folks tend to respond to men and women and have different expectations, is thinking about how these things are then moderated by different, different issues. So thinking about an issue like human rights, which is sort of normatively, or we think of as gendered as something that women work on, something that women know about. And this goes back to this kind of communitarian sort of assumption about leaders. So does that mean that if I hear a representative who I who is gendered as a woman, speak about human rights, I'm going to take that message more seriously, or I'm gonna weight it more heavily, if they're talking about something that's highly masculinized, like uh, nuclear security. Do I weight their messages differently based on uh, the topic itself that might be gendered? So when we think about when we make the argument that women will be compelled to behave more hawkishly or incentivized to perform a particular gender against type, what does this really mean? So we're looking at cases where women have been in office and have faced, in part because of the structure of the state and the ordering principles um, and the norms within the country regarding gender and regarding sex, that again, these expectations that women will behave more peacefully might make it difficult for a woman in a leadership position to actually gain the respect of their peers, particularly when they're in a vulnerable position or a position where uh, they're subject to a vote of no confidence, um, so in certain types of democracies, or they're just a lot of veto players, so power is, more, is less centralized, so they don't have as much independence. What does it mean that they are assumed to be peaceful by nature and less hard on security? And how might this affect their, their performance in office? And so we argue and find that in these cases, it actually, there are political incentives for women to act tougher than their male counterparts because of these assumptions that they're more peaceful by nature because in order to prove their competence, which has been equated with toughness and strength, um, which has been demonstrated earlier by scholars such as um, Tickner, that if they don't perform in this way, they might face repercussions, although we don't look into that aspect of it, but that there are incentives for them to behave more hawkishly. If they, if they start a dispute, if they sound tough on security, then they're not, then they sort of push against these assumptions that their colleagues have of them. But if they're also in a space where there are more women or they have more mobility, then they might not be as under, under the same pressure to signal that, that type of, that type of strength. Um, in which case we wouldn't expect them to behave any differently. And so we look at a couple of cases of this in the paper and we do um, some, Pretty, pretty standard statistical analysis of looking at the likelihood a leader will initiate a dispute cross-nationally from 1945 to 2007. And what we find is that in these types of systems exactly, where women are more vulnerable to removal and power is less centralized, that women will be more likely to initiate disputes than their male counterparts. But as soon as you increase this uh, increase the threshold of women's participation in executive office and you um, or power is more centralized in the in the leader we find that these these results wash away so thinking about 
if we think about an ordering, ordering system or principle um, in terms of patterns of expected behavior or and relations between states, we can see gender actually as one of potentially the, the, the most central um, organizing principles. If we think of, and this thinking of our everyday lives, we know that one of the reasons that gender and sex are so salient is it's one of the first organizing principles when we see someone new, what category we put them into. And even though, of course, these particularly gender um, and sex as well are malleable and vary in terms of the assumptions uh, across nationally and what the expectations are in gender norms, we know that these are, there's more continuity in regard to gender than there is with regard to race, ethnicity, religion. And so this is a principle that we know going back, if we want to look at sort of um, early modern Europe and the, the sort of marital relations that functionally structure the modern state through, through divorce, through um, sort of principled, uh, principled characters from um, Eleanor of Aquitaine on, or if we want to look sort of in contemporary, um, how, how misogyny, how the patriarchy, how the incel movement, how is this all connected to different types and different brands of radicalization, not just in the US, in, in Europe, in Latin America, in Africa, we see these connections to different types of, of frank, uh, frankly, mis misogyny. And these principles order a lot of different aspects of relationships between states. And again, I, was, I always think of um, Anne Towns' work, um, thinking about the different normative expectations regarding women, but also in terms of what the similarities are cross-nationally, what are the patterns. And thinking about gender critically can tell us a lot about this. Um, and I think can, can bridge a lot of connections that might not otherwise be so obvious. So again, I, I, we're thinking a lot, lot right now of uh, sort of the, ri the rise of the global right. What do these things have in common? Look to their, their rhetoric on women and with regard to women. Um, similarly in Russia, there's, there's connections there. But again, thinking back to state formation, sort of what are, what are the critical players and, and, and that, that, actually, uh, that actually structured the state? And how did marriage and uh, and the rights of women play into that in a sort of variety of different ways. Um, so these are just a few questions, and this is sort of uh, in addition to security policy and how we construe security uh, within the U.S. and elsewhere, and what's considered a, con a security concern. Uh, so I read, a, <laughs> I read a great new article in The New Yorker the other day, but it got me thinking about when we're, we're living in the middle of a pandemic right now, and yet the, the majority of monuments and um, sort of statues and remembrance and the social narrative regarding the, the security history of the state really doesn't talk about the 1918 flu or pandemics or natural disaster the same way it does about, about war. And I think thinking about how gender structures, even the memories of states, even the social narratives, what's considered security, um, these, I think, so I think it can be a very powerful thing to incorporate into our analytic toolbox. And so, you know, war is, uh, you know, um, uh, sort of, um, is you know, crudely, you know, thought to be a, a man's, a man's world. And, you know, for the longest time, you know, the assumption that, and oftentimes soldiers were only or exclusively men, whereas women were uh, serving in important roles, but often off the front lines. Um, again, though there's tremendous variation on this throughout history, this is just the sort of the case, case now. But war in part because it's connected to security, it's connected to weaponry, it's connected to protecting the homeland, all of which have uh, a lot of sort of masculinized assumptions built in. And also we know from studies of conflict itself, behavior in war, that there are aspects of sort of hyper masculinity, you know, toxic masculinity that are sometimes built into the system that make wars themselves, I don't want to say more palatable, but they facilitate a narrative surrounding war. Whereas something like a pandemic, and put aside natural disaster, but a pandemic, who are the frontline workers there? They're caretakers, functionally. 
what does it mean to die a good death? It's not sick in a bed, it's on a battlefield. And how are those deaths themselves um, gendered and what does that do to the memory of the state? Um, and this is something I've been batting around recently that I was interested in um, based on uh, some of Drew Fast Gilpin, uh, This Republic of Suffering and thinking about burial rights and memory and the role that death itself but large scale loss really play in constituting sort of social narratives and our understanding of what our, what our identity within states and sort of supranationally is and what's weighted and what's not oftentimes in those narratives. And I think there are, there is a large part to this that particular topics, because they're masculinized and they're gendered, take priority over those that objectively have caused a lot more damage in terms of the loss of human life. So sex, sex and gender are, are very different things and have different uh, assumptions built into them and can be problematized or in interrogated and challenged in different ways. So sex refers to the biological differences generally between men and women, although of, of course this doesn't, um, this doesn't incorporate the fact that gender, uh, that sex actually like gender operates on a continuum. So we generally think about it in terms of male, female, but of course there are folks who are intersex. There are folks that fit uh, across different uh, different points or identify on different points of the spectrum. And, you know, one interesting point is sort of what makes you a man versus makes you a woman. You know, some, some folks will point to chromosome, genitalia, but oftentimes we're talking about something different, but it's generally rooted in sort of biological differences. Whereas gender refers to the sort of social normative uh, expectations and lived experience of folks who are, who, are, um, who are men, women, gender non-conforming. And, and again, this is also different than, than, um, than sex because this isn't about any sort of biological difference. This is about the way that an individual presents, the expectation regarding their behavior, the um, presumption that you know, women will study certain things, will pursue certain things, um, will wear makeup, will talk uh, in a particular way, will wear certain types of clothes. And so these are, these are aspects of gender. And gender performativity is really about, it's not about being born, again, this, these sex differences as a, as a man or woman, but it's the idea that gender is an act in and of itself. So our behavior is what, um, is what uh, reifies or constitutes gender. In that is performativity. It's sort of the making and remake of these social and uh, normative components of this identity. And that and and Judith Butler, one of the things she argues is that you know this 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 process is iterative. It's it's kind of constantly ongoing. So one of the things I I personally have have liked so much in her in, in her work and her conceptualization of this is the idea that there is agency. But that doesn't mean you can throw out the system, right? You exist within the system. And the rules are, you know, you navigate them and you, you're in conversation with them and you can push them. But so it, it, it I think, strikes this, this, this um, almost individually uh, comforting, uh, comforting uh, chord where we both live in a system that has these rules regarding gender. Um, but that it's also fundamentally constructed and you can do things in your everyday life and you are a part of it. You're not sort of independent from it. So this is, this is something that I think is a challenge when you're studying, when you're studying gender or want to take gender seriously, right? Because if we're talking about gender as I just described as a sort of, as this collection of, um, sort of norms and assumptions regarding individual behavior and identity. How do you study that? It's really difficult in certain ways. Whereas studying biological sex or even, um, or as most frequently does, how folks present dichotomously is what is most often used. And this is in part because it lends itself to first quantitative analysis. So despite the fact that we have um, few women in office and this assumes you're studying leaders, um, you can count the way in which people present. 
you can and and off, and this can be misattributed. Um, and again, presuming that sex and and gender are the same is is problematic but there is an expectation that they will be correlated that folks who present as women will have some lived experience regarding the norms and perceptions of women um, but it does it does introduce this this tension that is true unfortunately and um, i will say with our work as well is a challenge in terms of how to study this um, and this gets back to methodology and thinking about um, feminist methodology and using a feminist lens. I will say a tension or a challenge with that is that moving away from this sort of positivist or quantitative analysis makes it very difficult to do work that is acceptable within at least main, uh, top journals and mainstream IR. So that doesn't mean that we can't study gender seriously. I think it one tool that uh, my co-author and I are particularly interested in is survey experiments, because I think it, there is a unique opportunity to measure perceptions. Um, but it is a challenge, and we have to think of creative ways um, to address this and, and be very careful not to, not to conflate these two things.